Up next, we have Tim Craggs from the University of Sheffield and a really enterprising new startup called Exciting Instruments. Mm. Uh, so I, I first heard of the story with Tim actually in the pub after one of his um, students in the lab. Um, ben. Hello, Ben. Uh, we were celebrating his Viva, and many tequila shots later, um, one, of our, one of our other friends, Gary, started talking about the intersection of religion and science, and my mind was blown, and I hope tonight yours is opened. Everyone, Tim Craggs. Okay, um, this is, I, I'm so far out of my comfort zone here, it's brilliant. So, so just bear, uh, what I would like to do today is just walk through some questions with you, right? Just, let, let's just try and think together. I know that's dangerous, right? Thinking, I always tell my students, don't think, just get on with it. Do the experiment, right? But no, let, let's try and think today a little bit. So, so science and religion, maybe this is a better title, is it? Science versus religion? In people's minds, I think this is what comes up when people think about faith and science. They think, oh, crikey, what do you mean faith and science? How can that possibly go together? But wait, right? Let's just go back a little bit in history. Not, not thousands of years, maybe hundreds of years, okay? Coper Has anyone heard of Copernicus? And, no, we're gonna need, this is going to be participatory, guys, okay? I know you've had a beer. Right, Coper Jamie's heard of Copernicus. No, 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 Copernicus, right. Copernicus, he, he was the first person to, to think about the sun not going around the earth, right? And the earth going around the sun, right? He was a Catholic Christian. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I didn't know that, actually. I'm, I'm lying, clearly. Okay, what about some other people, right? So people, if I said, who's the father of genetics? That is a really tricky question, right? Who's the father of genetics? Any names? Cuddly, you're not allowed to answer. Any other names spring to mind? Yeah, go on. Mendel. Mendel, brilliant. Do you know what? Do you know what he did? Do you know where he did all his experiments? Monastery. In a monastery. He did. No, exactly right. He is. He was an Augustinian monk, right? Why? I'm just just coming back to it. Why? Why do we have in our minds? that science and religion are somehow at loggerheads to each other. That's never, ever been the case, historically. So, just to, uh, this is just to give you some idea about what I do in my day job, right? This is, this is you know, some of the things. So, so I work at the University of Sheffield. Uh, I don't know what it is about academics. They like to call their labs after themselves. So sorry about that. But this is the Craig's lab. Um, be because it's my lab. <laughs> and, uh, but we build cool instruments that allow us to look, lit this, this is really cool, right? We literally, we can look at one molecule at a time. It's absolutely awesome. And what that means is, I'm not going to make you do this, but if you all stood up, right, and we were trying to get a, a, say we only had access to the average height of everybody in the room, it'd be pretty useless. Pretty useless. Because, you know, it turns out we've actually got half a room of giants and half a room of midgets, right? And, sorry, but you know, you know. And, and the average is useless. It's useless. It's the same in everything, right? So at the molecular level, you've got to go down to that level of one molecule. One molecule at a time. And so we built kits to do that in the lab. And now recently we built kits to do that so everybody else can do it as well. So we've just spun out this company... Exciting Instruments, what a great name, Rob. <laughs> Thank you. It's a great name, it's a great name. Exc because we use lasers like this, I know I was so pleased they gave me a laser, right? They use, we use lasers to excite the molecules. So that's why it's called Exciting Instruments. Anyway, that's the instrument. So what I want to do is just preempt this with saying, I, I am a scientist, right? That is what I do. And so, so it's not just about, um, so, uh, what I want to, uh, before we go any further, is just talk about some of the fun and the complexity of life, right? So again, it's not, this is a bit participatory. How much DNA is there in your body? If you were to take all of the DNA in your body, right, all of it, in every cell, and stretch it out, how far would it go? Okay, are we talking to Hillsborough and back? 
Oh, oh, very good. Oh, this is going to be a... Higher! Lower! Higher! No, no, we're not. We're not talking to Hillsborough and back. Are we talking to Barcelona and back? This is gonna this is gonna blow your mind, right? We're talking to the moon and back a hundred and five thousand times. That's how much DNA there is in your body right now. Right? I know that was a silent bit for anyone listening on the radio, right? That that was that was me with my mouth open. Like, no. Look, seriously, I took that picture with my telescope, by the way, that was bloody cool as well. No, no, no. It's, it's the moon. Good. Okay, um, and all that DNA in your body, every time a cell divides, you've got to copy that. In every cell, your cell is about a micron, about a micron, ten microns, right? There's two metres of DNA in one cell. Ha what? How does that get packaged up? How does that happen? That's what my lab wants to know. That's what we're interested in understanding. And to get to that, we've got to go one molecule at a time. We've got to get in there and see what's happening. I love science. It's my job. It's my salary. Well, until the instrument pays my salary. But it has limits. That's got stuff in it. Okay, here we go. Right. What's going to happen? What happens when I let go of my phone? What happens? It falls. Okay? Right. We're going to do another experiment. What happens when I let go of my phone? It falls. It falls. Great. What happens? Right. Great. Lovely. What happens? We're going to do another experiment. What happens when I let go of my phone? It falls. It falls. Can science tell us that every time I let go of my phone it falls? Can we prove scientifically by experimentation that every time I let go of my phone it's going to fall. Can, can we? Yeah. It, right, you, you cannot prove it. Science cannot prove that. We assume every time we do an experiment that's at a different point in the future that we get the same answer. That is an assumption, right? That is, let's, let's give that another word, that is faith. That is an assumption in our minds that says, actually, no, when I drop my phone, and if I drop my phone in Sheffield, it's going to do the same thing as if I drop my phone in London over here, it's going to do, I have to run around, apparently that happens in lectures as well, so you know, work with me. Um, it, it's, but that, that's an assumption, that is faith. There isn't anything else, literally, science can't prove that, you've got to assume it. Okay, so does science provide? Well, yes. Are there limits to the sort of questions that science can ask? Yes. I think it can, right? There are. If you go to your optometrist, right, they're going to look in your eyes and they're going to say, oh, you've got a little bit of a whatever it is, you know, slightly oblate cornea or something, you know. I don't know, I'm not an optometrist, who knows. Right, but. You go home and you look in your partner's eyes. What are you looking for? Love. Acceptance. Emotion. Can't, can't bottle that up. Can't write a formula for what that is. Is that any less real? No. It absolutely isn't. Especially as we've heard in you know, the previous talk. So... Has religion, has faith got something to fear from science? I was talking to, to, to a couple of people earlier about the, you know, God of the gaps ideas or anything else. Let me tell you something. When we do experiments, from my own perspective as a man of faith, we're just discovering something about the way God's made the world. That's all we're doing. The fact that we understand it I don't take away from the genius the fact that, that we've, we've listened to that wonderful poem and then had it unpacked for us doesn't take away from what we've, what we've heard or understood. That, that, that reality is not changed. We just know that someone's behind it. So no, there's no fear in faith. And then let me tell you something else. When we do 
do truly do good science, what are we trying to do? We're trying to understand the world. What, what does that phrase that up? We're seeking truth. We're trying to find truth. I'm going to tell you a secret that 90% of the world doesn't believe anymore. There is truth. There is, an, there is actually an absolute truth. This whole relativism utter bollocks, excuse my French. Your truth, Dan, your truth and my truth, it, you can't, there is actually truth. You can't just say, oh no, that's true for you, but it's for me, oh, I, oh no, I prefer to think about it like this. We can have opinions, but there is truth. And scientists believe in truth, because otherwise there's no freaking point in me doing an experiment here and someone else trying to repeat it somewhere else. There is a truth that we're trying to get to. That's what science is all about. And that's why faith has nothing to fear from science, because there's truth. And when we're trying to search for truth, that's great. There is nothing. There's no dichotomy. There's no war. There's no fight. Because we are in the search for truth. There's no fear. So in the last part of this little chat, which I'm really enjoying actually, so thank you for listening and laughing in all the right places and all that kind of stuff. I just want to touch on what is probably the most iconic kind of clash, right, where people think, my goodness, you know, well, okay, you're a scientist, and you tell me you're a man of faith, but come on, you know, Genesis, where did we come from? God made the world in six days, 4,000 years. What about evolution? So let, let's, let's just get there. Let's do it, right? We've got five minutes. <laughs> I'm not giving it to <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Right, so, so let's start. Let's start. It turns out, actually, that the guy who, who came up with the whole Big Bang Theory, um, this chap called Georges uh, Lemaitre, which is really badly pronounced French, but yeah, um, uh, he's Catholic, Christian. Died in 1967, something like that. Um, but let me just take us back. Let's just think about this for a minute. What happens at the Big Bang, right? So you've heard it, has everyone heard of the Big Bang? Probably. It's like the beginning of everything in the universe. But it's not just the beginning of the universe. Because what Einstein said, and I'm going to need hands here, so you're going to have to bear with me because I've got to hold a microphone. Um, Einstein says you've got. Like, we're, we're all happy with like coordinates, I guess, right? We've got X, Y, and Z. That's the three dimensions of space that we live in. That's fine, okay? What Einstein says is that actually time is kind of the fourth dimension, and it's all part of the same thing. So what happens at the Big Bang, right? We've got this expanding space. Well, literally, we call it space as well, don't we? So that's kind of helpful. We have expanding space. It's fine, I don't need it. I don't need it. Don't worry about it. I, I, I messaged Ben earlier because I was sat next to him and I didn't want to interrupt anyone. I said, it's always hilarious. I find it really hilarious when tech firms can't make the tech work. It's just <laughs> hilarious. But anyway, so... Yeah, you did. Yeah. So, the point is, the point is, we've got the Big Bang. It's not just space that's going from literally nothing and expanding. Actually, Scientifically, we cannot talk about a time before the Big Bang. Think about that for a minute. That is the beginning of time. That's, that's a creation event. That is like the start. We cannot scientifically talk about anything before that. It's impossible mathematically to go into the detail. That's called a singularity, right? It's like infinity, infinity. It's like you, there is no information that can pass through that moment. That is the beginning, not just of space, but of time. So scientifically, we have a moment of creation. Interesting, right? What's the other big bugbear? 
when people talk about science and faith. Come on. Dinosaurs, Dinosaurs evolution, that, right, exactly, evolution, let's go there. In, in the Bible, we have a story at the beginning of Genesis. We have a story. In fact, we have two stories. If you look carefully, which some of you may have done, right? We actually have, it's clever because they call it Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, so you know that there's two stories. No, it's like the chapters, but there's two stories, right? But in the second story, God says this, or the Bible says this, but you know, whichever. It says, let us make man, now oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> Magic. It wasn't magic, it was divinely inspired. Um, <laughs> then, just look at this. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. I'm going to break that down, right? The Lord God said, formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils about two steps. Two steps, right? We are completely at liberty to understand that sentence, formed from the dust of the ground, as a process of pre-existing matter, the dust of the ground. It's already there. That is absolutely fine to understand in an evolutionary mindset, right? The, the body that we have was produced from evolution. Church says, Absolutely, that's totally possible. We're not going to give it our rubber stamp of absolute truth, because frankly the scientists aren't absolutely ever true about anything, right? Or sure, in that sense. But it's perfectly possible. So that's fine. And then what's the next bit? It's that's the spirituality. That is who we are as spirit, right? That's the, the bit when you look into your partner's eyes, right? And this isn't just true at the beginning of creation. This is exactly what happens every time a child is born. The parents create the child. Yes, they do. We know how that works biologically, physically understanding what happens. But spiritually, God is involved in that moment of conception. The soul, the being, the, the thing that makes us human is implanted in that moment. The how versus the why. So let me end with this then. Why? Because science can't tell you why. It can tell you how, and it's fabulous and fascinating and wonderful to understand the why, the how, sorry, the, the like actually what happens. And for me, at a molecular level, literally those single molecule microscopes, you should all buy one. Um, you know, <laughs> they're brilliant. And understanding that level of detail of what happens is phenomenal. But why? Science is silent. What does God say? God says, let us make man in our own image. After our likeness. Let them rule over the rest of creation. Good job we're doing there, guys. But let us make man in our image. What does that mean? It means, let us make man in a way. Let us make him male and female. Let them make the pair be in relationship with each other. Let them communicate. Do you know what? The, the next thing he says is, go forth and multiply. Come on, right? Yeah, that's what he said. He says, be, be together, but not just with each other. Don't just be together with each other, but be in relationship with me as God. No, I have given you the opportunity. I've given you the intelligence. More than that, I've given you a spirit that can know me. I am greater than anything you can possibly imagine. I've created the entire universe. Why? 
out of love for you.